Go. Welcome back. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Lord, who has caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now we're on to chapter 20 of the first book of Kings, and you'll remember that last week Elijah had a week off. Um, he'd had his sulk, he'd got his new lease of life, and then Ahab was just carrying on without him, and Ahab actually was behaving rather better than usual, um, defeating Ben-Hadad twice, but then sparing his life, which was not what the Lord wanted him to do. So we are going to see both um, Elijah and Jezebel. Uh, if you like, you know, Bible as pantomime, uh, <laughs> you can boo when she comes on. But um, before we do, I'm going to read you a poem. Don't worry, it's not one I've written myself. Um, it's by Jonathan Swift, so quite a respectable poem. And um, if you just want to go home quickly, this actually tells you everything that's going to happen in chapter 20 uh, of uh, Kings tonight. Is it chapter 20 or chapter 21? I'm confused. 21, there we are. Um, 21 is what I mean. And it's called The Garden Plot. Clever name. When Naboth's vineyard looked so fine, the king cried out, Would this were mine? And yet no reason could prevail to bring the owner to a sale. Jezebel saw, with haughty pride, how Ahab grieved to be denied, and thus accosted him with scorn. Shall Naboth make a monarch mourn? A king and weep? The ground's your own. I'll vest the garden in the crown. With that she ha hatched a plot and made poor Naboth answer with his head. And when his harmless blood was spilt, the ground became his forfeit guilt. It's rather good, isn't it? So, who is Naboth? What happens to his vineyard? We have a nice picture, which I think I showed you before, by um, Matthew Rook, who was Burnt Jones's assistant um, of... Uh, Naboth tending his vines and Ahab arriving in the vineyard. And it happened after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard that was in Jezreel, near the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Where is Jezreel? Well, I have a map. Jezreel is a bit north of the capital of Israel, which is Samaria. So um, you can see, I'll pass this round if you could have a closer look. There is um, Samaria and there is Jezreel. It's a bit further north. It's the country residence of the kings of Israel. I assume it's a bit cooler in the summer. Um, and so probably be where they retreat to. Um, think of it as, uh, I don't know, Sandringham or Windsor. Um, and you notice, to pass that round, that um, the scriptures describe Naboth as being a Jezreelite. He's actually from the place. Whereas Ahab, who in the previous chapter was always described as being king of Israel, was described as king of Samaria. You know, it's like saying he's from that London. He's the king of Samaria, so he's not a local. And um, nevertheless, when he's on his summer holiday uh, in Jezreel, he decides that he wants to get hold of this lovely vineyard uh, that um, Naboth has. And Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it as a garden of greens, for it is close to my house. And let me give you in its stead a better vineyard. Or, should it be good in your eyes, 
Let me give you silver as its price. So Ahab says, actually, why does he have that vineyard when it's next to my palace? I'd like to get hold of it. But a striking thing is that even though Ahab, we already know, is not a particularly admirable king, we do observe that in Israel, in this period, there is a rule of law. The king can't simply say to Naboth, hand over your vineyard, it's the king's now. He has to enter into this negotiation. And he says, I'll give you a better one, or if you like, I'll pay you silver for it. And Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give away the estate of my fathers. So Naboth says no, and the reason he gives is that this is his ancestral land. And perhaps that's a concept that modern people find a little hard to understand, but there was um, the idea that the land which God had given to a particular tribe, a particular family, uh, should remain with that family. And even if it was sold, it could never be sold permanently. Uh, so in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, um, you will remember uh, that the Lord says, The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. So part of the idea is, you know, the land isn't something which is a commodity to be bought and sold. The Lord has apportioned it, and ultimately it belongs to him. So Naboth is being very pious by saying, um, I can't alienate this land. Similarly, in the book of Numbers, when uh, the daughters of Zelophehad, uh, he has these um, uh, five daughters and no sons, and they come to Moses and say, can't we inherit the land? And Moses says, yes, but there is a condition. Um, he says, uh, they may only marry within the family of the tribe of their father. The inheritance of the people of Israel shall not be transferred from one tribe to another, for every one of the people of Israel shall cleave to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. So land rights are ideally inalienable, and that's why Naboth, despite getting this good offer from the king, says no. And Ahab came to his house sullen and morose over this thing that Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him and said, I will not give away the estate of my fathers. And he lay down on his couch and turned away his face and ate no food. Ahab's basically a bullshit toddler. Uh, <laughs> and he goes home and he says, it's not fair. I wanted that vineyard. He won't give it to me. No, I'm not going to eat anything. I'm going, oh. And he's totally sullen and morose. We heard about him being sullen and morose <laughs> at the end of the last chapter when he's told uh, by the man of God, you know, that you're going to pay for not having treated Ben-Hadad as you should. And so once again, he's stamping his foot and he's, no, don't want to. And he just goes to bed. And Jezebel, boo, his wife, came to him and said, What is this? You are sullen in spirit and eat no food. Now, before we find out what she says yet, I remember I've got a picture of this. But first of all, this is a lovely picture. This is by the Methodist artist, um, whose name is James Smetham. And uh, I'll pass it around, okay? Try not to press any buttons or you'll, you'll, you'll uh, uh, move on to the next slide. But it, it, it's a lovely picture of Naboth, a kind of idyllic scene, with his little baby there, enjoying the, the, the grapes in his vineyard, um, all that Ahab is about to, uh, uh, to take from him. So Jezebel says, what is this? Why are you sullen in spirit and eat no food? He spoke to her. When I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for silver, or if you wish I shall give you a vineyard, and he said, 
He said, I will not give you my vineyard. He slightly tweaked the story. Firstly, he says, first I offered him silver, then another vineyard. So he's trying to his wife to appear. Oh, I went in and I told him. I said, I'll give you silver. And then if not, another vineyard. And also he, um, he doesn't say that Ahab says, it's because the Lord um, has given us this land. The Lord forbid. He just says that Naboth is stubborn and he says, no, I'm not going to give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, you now must act like a king over Israel. Rise and eat food and be of good cheer. I myself will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she says, you call yourself a king? Be like a man. Come on, I'll, I'll get hold of what you need. Does she remind you of any other wicked queen? historical and also in literature. Lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth. I think Lady Macbeth is clearly based on Jezebel. Obviously Jezebel comes before. Um, but she is also the one who um, who is the ruin of her husband really. Um, I'm not saying Macbeth would be uh, you know, the perfect gentleman without her but she is the one who, who does the dirty uh, and uh, she's clearly the one who and to use a phrase, where's the trousers in that relationship? <coughs> so does Jezebel. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and the notables who were in his town who dwelled with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth at the head of the people and seek two worthless fellows opposite him, that they may bear witness against him, saying, You have cursed God and the king, and take him out and stone him to death. Dear. There is, um, oh, there is, a, this is from the Nuremberg Chronicles. There's Naboth. I'll let you look at this again closely later, if you like. And there, um, back uh, to, um, what was his name? Uh, Matthew Rook, Ma Matthew Rook, uh, he is, there is Jezebel um, trying to, you know, worm out of Ahab, what's the matter? Now, um, she comes up with this scheme. Again, it tells us Jezebel doesn't just, she can't just march in and take the vineyard. She has to co cook up this legal fiction. And um, does it remind you of, of, anything, writing a letter, sealing it, sending it off, and so securing somebody's death? Hamlet. Say it again? Hamlet. Hamlet, oh, you're thinking Rosencrantz yeah, and Gilderstone yeah. of death. That's, that's similar. Also, um, you're rather Hittite. Uh, um, remember when uh, David sends the message, and he actually, in that occasion, just like with Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, um, he gets Uriah to carry the message, um, send him into the thick of battle. So Jezebel, is she usurping the king's authority? Possibly, she writes in his name and she seals it with his seal. A question we'll come to in a minute. Is Ahab responsible? Well, he knows Jezebel. Does he think that she's just going to sweet talk Naboth into giving over the vineyard? When she says, I'll sort it. He knows, um, you know, remember her, her threats against Elijah earlier on. He knows what she's capable of. But he um, thinks that he can keep himself out of getting his own hands dirty. Monarchs often do that. Um, tomorrow, uh, His Majesty the King will open Parliament. There was one occasion in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I when she didn't turn up to open Parliament. She stayed at Richmond. It was in 1586, and she thought that by staying at home, she herself wouldn't bear the guilt of the proceedings against her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, though she knew perfectly well what was going to happen. Uh, so sometimes um, uh, those in power kind of they turn, a, they turn aside knowing perfectly well the evil that's being done in their name. And um, 
there's something very brazen about what Jezebel writes. Proclaim a fast and say, Naboth's cursed God and the king. You know, so she actually uses the pious um, intentions of people in order to um, falsely, you know, falsely to condemn uh, Naboth. These two worthless fellows, um, literally sons of Balliol, we've heard that expression uh, before, meaning um, people who are very wicked, and he's to be stoned to death. And the men of his town, the elders and the notables who dwelled in his town, did as Jezebel had said to them, and as was written in the letters that she had sent them, proclaim a fast, and seat Naboth at the head of the people. And the two worthless fellows came and sat opposite him. And the two worthless fellows bore witness against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed God and the king. And they took him outside the town and stoned him to death. And they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and he is dead. So, she gets her way through this bit of subterfuge. And the letter comes back again, um, like the message uh, that David gets uh, uh, from uh, Joab about Uriah the Hittite. Uh, oh, and at the end, oh, Uriah the Hittite is dead. And it happened when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, Jezebel said to Ahab, rise and take hold of the vineyard of Naboth, uh, the Jezreelite, who refused to give it to you for silver. For Naboth is not alive, for he is dead. Hmm. We have that little picture here, um, an copper engraving of him being stoned. I'll let you look at that at the end, and then this one is a bit clearer. Um, poor Naboth there, um, uh, coming a cropper. And so Jezebel walks in, and I... I suppose, you know, the, the, the narrative suggests, you know, Ahab is still sulking and sullen and morose and she comes and says, it's all right, I've sorted it, by the way, Naboth's dead. Um, you don't need to worry, go and, go, and, go and take possession of the vineyard. And Ahab asks no questions. And when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab rose to go down to the vineyard of Nahoth, Na Naboth the Jezreelite to take hold of it. So that's all going to be lovely, isn't it? However, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Rise, go down to meet Ahab king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Look, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take hold of it. And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, have you murdered and also taken hold? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Where the dogs licked Naboth's blood, they will lick your blood too. So uh, Elijah is tipped off. And we notice, sometimes when Elijah does things, we might wonder whether it's more Elijah following his own instincts, and uh, he rather likes telling people they're for it and uh, causing uh, uh, pain and distress. On this occasion, it's very clear that the Lord has told him precisely what has happened and what the response is going to be. And um, this is about the worst thing that can happen to anyone. Not only are they going to die, um, but the dogs are going to lick up their blood. And we learn another little thing about what happened to Naboth here. Not only was he stoned to death, although an innocent man, but actually his corpse was then exposed, which in the ancient world uh, was a terrible taboo uh, you know, to, to allow the desecration of a dead body. Uh, so Naboth has had everything taken from his ancestral land, his life, and then his dignity as a human being. But Ahab, he's going to have exactly the same fate. And in the same place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, Ahab's blood is going to be licked up as well. And Ahab said to Elijah, 
Have you found me, O oh my enemy? So the moment that Ahab arrives at the vineyard thinking this will do nicely, um, you know, it's a, like a nightmare estate agent's viewing. <laughs> There's Elijah and, and he doesn't think, oh, nice to see you, Elijah. Uh, fancy you being here. Remember, Elijah um, was hiding uh, down in Beersheba and suddenly Elijah, tipped off by the Lord, comes and he says, well, he doesn't say anything. The moment he sees him, Ahab said, oh, you found me, have you, my enemy? And he said, I have found you, inasmuch as you have given yourself over to doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, I am about to bring evil upon you, and I will root you out. Um, he uses the imagery a bit like the vineyard, you know, the kind of agricultural, I'm going to dig you up and you're going to, uh, you're going to have no um, roots left at all. And I will cut off every pisser against the wall of Ahab's, and ruler and helper in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, and like the house of Baasha, son of Ahijah, for the vexation with which you vexed me, leading Israel to offend. Um, Elijah has actually um, uh, elaborated a bit on what the Lord says. He, he, he makes it even more intense. He says, not only are you going to die, I'm going to destroy your whole family. And just like happened to Jeroboam, and Baasha came and got rid of him, that's going to happen to you, and it happened then to Baasha. Your father Omri got rid of him, well, it's going to happen to you. And there'll be nothing left. Not a single pisser against the wall. More decorous biblical translations call that um, uh, a man of your house. Um, but um, Robert Alter translates uh, uh, very directly. Um, so the Revised Standard Version is cut off from Ahab every male bond or free in Israel. I've got a man jack in the new. Man jack? What is a man jack? I, I yes. <laughs> yes. Anyway, well, yes, what it actually says is that. Um, so, uh, it's not good news, is it? And you'll notice that there's a re repeated uh, theme here. Uh, Charles has his, has his sheet as a good student there. Uh, and you see that in the history of the House of Israel, unlike the House of Judah, there is continual change. Uh, so first of all, we had the House of Jeroboam, then the House of uh, Baasa, and now we have the House of Omri. But they, you know, they, they go around, you know, like conservative prime ministers, you know, <laughs> blink and you miss them. And you'll notice that the language is very similar as well. Um, uh, Hijah the Shilonite said about the House of Jeroboam, since I have lifted you up, you have done worse than all came before you. About Jehu says about Baasa, since I have lifted you up, you have gone the way of Jeroboam. Elijah says about Ahab, since you have devoted yourself to doing evil in the sight of God. And so it, it continues the, the, the same um, repetition um, that all of them actually come in with some hope that you know, the Lord says, if you're faithful to me, I will hold you up. I will make your line continue. Um, if you're not, then it won't. And for Jezebel too, the word of the Lord came saying, the dogs shall devour Jezebel in the flat land of Jezreel. Ahab's dead in the town, the dogs shall devour, and the dead in the field, the fowl of the heavens shall devour. Surely there was none like Ahab who gave himself over to doing evil in the eyes of the Lord as Jezebel his wife and enticed him to do. And he acted most loathsomely to go after foul idols, as all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had dispossessed before the Israelites. Now that's a little editorial comment. That's not Elijah's line, although no doubt he would agree with it. Um, we notice two things. Firstly, um, the actual offence in this case is theft and murder. Um, those are pretty bad things. Uh, we notice that it prefigures the concern that all the later prophets will have with the defence of the rights of the poor. You see that uh, in 
Isaiah, uh, in Jeremiah, but especially uh, in the prophet Amos, uh, who uh, inveighs against the, the fat cows of Bashan lolling on their ivory couches uh, while the poor are starving and people haven't got enough to eat or, or to sustain their families. So there's a, a social justice point being made there. But the editorial comment by the Deuteronomic historian points to a cultic sin that Ahab and Jezebel have committed, which is idolatry, which isn't mentioned in this particular story. But actually the two go together, and they do in the later prophets too. If you have wrong worship, then you will also inevitably have a wrong manner of life. Um, and that's sometimes because the, uh, the false gods demand things like human sacrifice or cultic prostitution, but also because worship of the Lord means being <coughs> single-hearted, pure-hearted, um, having a, a, a kind of straightness in your life. Uh, and if you go wrong in that, you'll also veer in your relations with your fellow human beings. You'll also be uh, venal and cheating and dishonest and, 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 and murderous even. And the other echo that we find here is of in the end of the life of Solomon earlier in this book. Solomon who starts well, who has wisdom given him by God, who's promised, you know, that... Um, he will have his descendants on the throne after him. But at the end of his life, his many wives turn him away from that early promise. And because of that, he, he whores after false gods. He does dreadful things. He um, sets up cultic pillars and shrines and, and goes on the top of the mountains um, worshipping these false gods. It's exactly the same. Um, Ahab only needs one wife to make him do this, um, whereas Solomon at least had the excuse of having hundreds of them. Uh, we know that Ahab does have uh, other wives from the last chapter, but Jezebel's the only one we really hear about. She entices him to act most loathsomely, to go after false idols. So, you know, it's really sad because the whole point of them being given this land in the first place was so that they could be a different kind of people so that they could be in their promised land, in this kind of nuptial relationship even with God. And instead they turn away. And Ahab, we're told, this is not the first time we've been told this, he's the worst king so far. <laughs> and so they just seem to get worse and worse and worse. And the, the good news, or the bad news, is they're going to get even worse later on. Um, and it happened... When Ahab heard these words, that he rent his garments and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay down on the sackcloth and walked meekly. Oh, that was a surprise, wasn't it? <laughs> Ahab, it seems, has repented. And we know that when, this is a very similar moment, isn't it? You know, when um, uh, the, the prophet Nathan meets King David after he's committed adultery with Bathsheba and has had Uriah the Hittite, her husband, murdered. And Nathan meets him and, and says, Thou art the man. And David repents and he puts on sackcloth and, and he, he, he fasts <coughs> and, he, uh, and he weeps. And God forgives him. And it might seem that Ahab has done the same. Is Ahab sincere? That's a, a question that was often asked. I think the truth is that Ahab has moments of religious fervour. Just as we saw at the beginning of the previous chapter, that he has moments when he's doing the Lord's work and he's acting as a just king and uh, leading his people. And then it always seems to be Jezebel who drags him back down again. Uh, when he goes home to Jezebel and says, you never guess what happened on Mount Carmel, and she says, oh, I'll get that, Elijah. Uh, and uh, it takes her some days perhaps to win him round, but Elijah has to flee. And the same seems to happen again. So it's a temporary um, penance that he has. Nevertheless, we see that you know, the Lord is never unjust. 
The Lord always wants us to turn back to him. The Lord isn't trying to trick us in our, catch us out in our sins. It might seem as though, you know, to Ahab, that Elijah's always there. Oh, you know, I've got away for it with you. It wasn't for you pesky prophets. <laughs> um, but actually, the purpose of God sending the prophets is always to bring to repentance. And this is what Ahab does. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen that Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. In his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So in fact, Ahab gets a little bit of a reprieve. Um, he will not be the last of his line. He will, however, die in battle. The dogs will lick up his blood, just to get you to come back next week so you get that <laughs> satisfying <laughs> moment. But uh, his son will later rule in his stead and, and his son will be even worse. And so it's his son who therefore becomes the last of the line. But at least we see that the Lord wants him to repent. What there's no record of is um, Elijah going and telling him this, saying, all right, your repentance is uh, acceptable, because maybe he might go on with it. But uh, if you remember, I compared Elijah with Jonah, who when he goes uh, to the king of Nineveh and says, you've got to repent, and the king of Nineveh does repent, and all the people of Nineveh fast, and even the animals fast. And Jonah is really crotchy, so I knew that would happen. And I was looking forward to seeing you zapped. And instead, God's going to let you off. Typical. No wonder I didn't want to do this. And, and I suspect there might be a little bit about Elijah about that. He's saying, oh, now he's gone and listened to me. Uh, that's the, what I didn't want. Um, uh, so there is an ambiguity, I think. And um, the sages, the ancient rabbis, were divided about Ahab. Some said that he had some merit. Um, we'll see he has some merit next week when he does die in battle against Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, whom he should have killed when he could. Um, Ahab is wounded and yet he's, he has himself stood up in the chariot so that people don't know this because they'll all lose heart and flee. And so he actually sacrifices his own life for the good of the country, for the good of the people. And that he has some merit. On the other hand, other rabbis said, uh, and it says in some versions of the Talmud, that um, Ahab is one of those kings who have no share in the life to come, uh, that he's so utterly corrupted by Jezebel. Uh, and of course, um, I don't want to spoil the story, but Jezebel comes to a really sticky end. Interestingly, though, about Ahab and Jezebel, and why, why one reason why they're interesting to us is they have a daughter who goes on to marry a king of Judah, and she she's just as wicked as her parents, and, and she ends up being defenestrated in the most spectacular way. But because of this, Ahab and Jezebel are ancestors of our blessed Lord uh, and when we think of you know these some of the most wicked people in the Bible perhaps in history nevertheless they are the stock which Jesus takes to himself in becoming a human being and so through all these rather disedifying stories you know horrible murders and, and deceptions and and show trials our lord comes into the world in order to show mercy to forgive and to redeem even the greatest depths of human wickedness so you shouldn't go away despairing and i will stop there because the next bit of the story um, would take us too long any um i'll say a prayer and then you can ask questions after we stop filming uh, that's probably uh, the best way to I pray thee, loving Jesus, that as thou hast graciously given me to drink in with delight the words of thy knowledge, 
so thou wouldst mercifully grant to me to get, attain one day to thee the fountain of all wisdom and to appear forever before thy face. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.